This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 434. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everyone? It's Brandon Turner, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with another phenomenal episode with a real estate hero of mine. I use that word very seldom in my life, but I'm not kidding. This our guest today, Scott McGivelry. I hope I'm not butchering the last name too bad. We joked about that on the show about trying to pronounce that. Uh, he was a guy that really got me into real estate heavily back in like 07, 08, 09, uh, with a television show he had called Income Property. He was on for like. 12 seasons. We talk about that a little bit today, but uh, I'm pumped about that. David Green, welcome to the show. I didn't forget about you. I just couldn't stop gushing about Scott. How you doing, man? I'm good. Hey, I wouldn't blame you for gushing. We just got done recording him and it was, that was terrific. Yeah. Whether you're just starting off trying to figure out how do I get over the initial hurdles where I'm stuck or you, you got a little momentum and you're trying to figure out how do I get to the next step? Yeah. Or you're one of those people that's already done it and you listen to the podcast because you like remembering stuff and you still want to be pushed a little bit. I think that this one has something for everyone to every level. hundred percent agree. Yeah. I, I wrote down a couple of notes as we went through it, like to make sure I bring up his, how he got to 25 units by 25 years old. Amazing. So if you're young, listen, that uh the what we call the scotty mac method or the mm -hmm. scotty mc method uh for getting your offer accepted totally a cool way to get your offers increase the chance that your offer gets accepted very cool strategy uh he goes and talks about the economy later and i know that some people are like well that sounds boring listen like his understanding of where the u.s economy and the world economy is headed over the next few years could completely transform your business like i'm not even i'm not kidding here like this could like change your business forever so listen for that uh plus a whole lot more plus is just the theme of growth and what i call the stack we didn't talk about the the terminology of the stack today but what he's teaching today throughout his entire journey is this concept that i have referred to on the show before as the stack listen for that uh just life-changing stuff you're gonna love it but before we get to that let's get to today's quick yeah, tip tip today's quick tip is brought to you by david green david what you got <laughs> All right, real quick tip for you. Get around some other investors that are in the same boat you are, okay? A big mistake people make is they look for somebody 10 steps ahead of where they're at and they get paralyzed by the problems that that person's having. And frankly, that person really doesn't give much good advice for the someone getting started. Yeah. Um, Scott did a great job on today's podcast of taking you back to what it felt like to be in that boat where he's literally getting the money for his down payment from the first and last month's <laughs> deposit of the tenants that he's yep. going to rent the house to. And it just rem it rem reminded me of what it was like when I was scared to death and I laid there all night long thinking I should have waited for prices to drop more. What was I thinking? And now that house has tripled in value. So get around other people that are at the same level where you're at. Talk about your feelings. Talk about your fears. Get that encouragement. A lot of times just getting it out of you will help you realize that it's not always reasonable and make the path easier for yourself. Brandon, you say it all the time. Walking this journey with other investors is what it's about. Yeah. And you know, that's a really good point. I never thought about that before, about how like people will listen to the problems that maybe I have or you have, and then they get all stressed out about it. But to borrow a phrase, uh, a phrase from, I know Kelly Williams uses a lot, and uh, but you haven't, most people, I'm not sure to say most, but a lot of people, if you're just new, especially, You've not earned the right to have the problems that I'm having that David's having, right? Like, so you don't need to worry about them. Like you haven't, you haven't got to that. Like you don't need to stress out. Like, how am I going to get 10, in, you know, 10 loans? Uh, in the, like, don't bank shut you after, after 10. Like you, you don't need to worry about those things. You'll have problems later on in life. Like right now your problem is like, how do I find that duplex or whatever? And maybe you're farther along. Maybe you've got way bigger problems than I do. And I have not earned the right to have your problems. So there's a, there's one piece of like learning from mentors and us being like, you know, listen to the big deals of the world. But there's another piece that you just need to get around people who are at or just slightly above your level. There you go. That's what's going to help you pull you to that level. Yeah, that was really good. Quick Absolutely. Tip. Good job, David. Uh, I see you're wearing your new Follow the Fire t-shirt today. I like that. Follow I'm the talking Fire. about it constantly. This is what we talk about on my team. This is what I talk about with people that come to me. A lot of the questions that new investors have when they get stuck have to do with the fact that they're trying to solve a problem that is not their fire. Mm. And that's why they're stuck on it. And uh, I, I just want to encourage everybody who's listening. You have a passion, you have skills, you have something that juices you up. 
run after that and then find other people, other products, other things to help you handle the stuff that doesn't juice you up. Now it is time to get in today's show with Scott McGivory. He told me it was like delivery. Scott McGivory. Givelry. I'm going to butcher it every time. Anyway, like I said, this guy was a huge impact on my life. I'm excited to introduce you to him today. He delivers an amazing, amazing interview. You're going to love it. Putting the delivery in McGillivray. All right, Scott, welcome to the Bigger Pockets podcast. I'm not going to say your last name because I will screw it up. So we're just going to say Scott. How you doing? I'm good. How are you, Brandon? Man, I am fantastic. This has been a long time coming. I got to say, back... Uh, 2000 and I don't know what it was whenever I started the bigger pockets podcast with Josh back in the day first week we said who is our dream guests for the bigger pockets podcast who do we really want to have on this show and uh, I'm pretty sure you were either in the top one or top two or three of guests we wanted to have and we almost we kind of almost did it once and then there was a tech problem and so now here we are eight years later and we finally nailed it down. I'm, I'm pumped. eight years later, bro. And here we are. Well, listen, I'm, uh, I'm flattered that I was on your list and, and I'm, I'm sorry that didn't work. I actually remember yeah, because uh, it was the first podcast I was asked to be interviewed on. And that's funny. I was in New York and my publicist was trying to get us connected. And I had like, I was lined up for a whole media thing. And, uh, I remember we were having tech issues and then we we're like, Oh, we'll have to reschedule, reschedule it. And, and then Never it did. took us 12 years. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> so a little bit of background. So my wife and I used to watch, I mean, you know this, but we used to watch Income Property, which you were the host of for, wait, like, wasn't it like 10 seasons you were on that show? Like, we did. Forever? We did 12 seasons, almost 200 episodes of Income Property. Yeah. Yeah. You were, you were like house hacking before house hacking was a thing. You were talking about and teaching house hacking. Like, like that was like the inspiration for so much of what we have built at bigger pockets. You were like the foundation builder here of like, this is what it just works. Like the idea of like turning, let me ask you, what was the show about? Let me, let me make the show about you not me explaining about you. What was the show about? Why was income property so awesome? Well, I mean, well, thanks. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I got actually, I've been, I've been in real estate investing for 21 years and I got started pretty early, but, um, then a friend of mine who worked in television asked me to help on a show to do some construction. And I was sort of in the background helping building a kitchen. And then they're like, oh, you were you were great on camera. Can you do a few more? So I kind of did this part time construction in the background of these TV shows uh, while I was building my real estate portfolio in my 20s. And um, and that's a, at that point, you know, someone at the network eventually approached me on set and said, listen, we've been watching these episodes. You do a great job. We think there might be an opportunity for you to do your own construction show. And, and they started asking me what I do. And I said, well, to be honest, I mean, I have my contractor's license. I like construction, but I'm, I'm more of the real estate investor guy, to be honest. Like I invest in real estate. That's what I do. And we had this long conversation and it really came to the point where they said, you know what? It's just too far. I think they said too left of center. They're like, it's just too far from what we do on this network. You know, if it was painting or design or it was, you know, construction and building maybe, but real estate investing, it might be, it might be just too far outside the box. But I was able to somehow convince them that, you know, there's this huge untapped audience of people who want to be real estate investors, not just, you know, real estate's not just about construction and just about design. It's a massive financial opportunity and investment for people. And I wanted to tackle that side of the, of the spectrum. And I remember when we were shooting the first episode of Income Property, it was in one of my properties <laughs> and everyone was like completely oblivious. The producers were like, you just go with this because we have no idea. We've never done a show like this. We don't know what we're talking about. What are these numbers? You're talking about mortgage rates. You're talking about rental rates. You're talking about cash flow. They're like, this isn't going to fly with our audience. And uh, but it was, you know, I was passionate and I still am about real estate and it was, you know, it was a bit of like a, an underground show when it launched income property in like 2007, this show launched with zero publicity. And it was just sort of like a, they're like, just fill some space with this show. <laughs> and we built up this, this, we brought in this whole new audience of people who were like, yes, I want to know about real estate investing. And finally, like somewhere to get credible information. And it, and it, and it really took off in an odd way. And after the crash of 2008, I remember so many shows were canceled and um, basically the, the president of the network at that time was named in Time magazine as one of the people to blame for the 2008 market oh, crash. 
<laughs> and they said, the only reason why we're not naming him as number one is because he started putting shows on that look at the fundamentals of real estate, like income property, instead of just telling people to spend, you know, absurd amounts of money fixing up their houses just because they want to. And so this spun, this, you know, put our show right on the map. And we kind of came through the 2008 crash as a bit of a hero show. And, and literally like the audience built and I was just shocked. I was, I remember when fans started coming up to me in the streets and I, I said to my wife, I'm like, I can't believe I've been renovating basements by myself. Nobody has ever come to look at me do this. <laughs> everyone's like, yeah, yeah. He's down there renovating the basement. You don't want to see what's going on. As soon as we started filming it, everyone's like, look at that. He's fixing them up and we want to see it. And, uh, and so, yeah, we, we ended up doing hundreds of episodes, literally. Right. It was crazy. Yeah. It was just such a cool show to be able to see, like you could own a house and then turn the attic or the basement or whatever into another unit. And then it would pay your more. And sometimes on the show, right, you would have the guest be like, we actually decided to move into the basement, rent our upstairs out. And now we're living for free. And I was like, what? Like, that's a thing. Like, that's that was so thing, cool. Man. Yeah. <laughs> so good. So yeah, good. Well, we got lots of we have lots of shows going on. We're doing the Vacation House Rules show right, yeah. now, right now, which is all about, you know, people are dreaming about these dream. People are dreaming about moving to Maui, bro. Yep. I don't you know. You wouldn't why. know anything about I would, that. I wouldn't know nothing about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we show them how they can do it, right? Like we show them here's how you can have your dream property yep. and keep your primary residence at the same time and you know, do a little bit of renting. Everything yeah. the world's just changed. People are savvier and there's just way more information now. It's so true. Yeah, I literally, I mean, I own a I own a three unit in Maui with like ocean view, pool, whatever. It's like it's an amazing house. Uh that I can, if I wanted to, I could live for free here. Because I mean, I choose to leave one of the units empty out of the three because I, I like having family and friends hang out with me. But like you can live in Hawaii. Like I can live here cheaper than the people who are living down in the apartments down in like like the worst neighborhoods of Maui just because I'm, I'm house hacking my dream vacation property. It's crazy. Bro, one of my biggest regrets is actually in Hawaii, believe it or not. I, um, I was there for my the first time I was there it was my honeymoon in 2008 I got married in 2008 the show had just sort of launched and was was kicking and and we were in Honolulu and I went to um like the launch of a condo they were launching this brand new condo on the water and they could not move any of these units they were they were just desperate to get rid of them and I went to um, I went to the bank there, and I was able to get approved for a mortgage in Hawaii there at the bank. And I went in and I secured eleven condos. I had eleven condos wow. under contract for about a hundred and fifty grand a piece. <laughs> and and my wife got upset. She's like, "I can't believe you spent the, one of the whole days of our honeymoon at the bank yep. <laughs> and at a condo launch, and you're going to buy all these condos." I'm like, "It just makes sense. You can rent these things out at like 130 to 160 thousand dollars. These things seem really cheap." And uh, and so I, but then I backed out of the whole thing. I'm like, "You know, this is my honeymoon. What am I doing? This is crazy. This is crazy." I got out of there, and we went back. I think we were there four or five years ago. And those condos were like eight hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> and my wife's like, I can't believe you let me talk you out of it. I'm yep. like, how is it my fault both ways? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that yeah, highlights good. a great point though with investing is there's always gonna be people that say don't do it. Yeah. And many of them will turn around and say, you know, you really should have did that thing <laughs> back in the day, right? Like where you get your advice from is is pretty powerful. Dave, I just honestly, like we joke about it. I'm like, I can't go back. I can't go back to Honolulu. I can't go yep. back. It's too much. Yep. <laughs> the pain is too deep. The pain is, the pain <laughs> is too real. It's too real. <laughs> <laughs> Though it's funny. is like, I, I just know in 30 years from now, 20 years from now, we'll be looking back and be like, remember when you could buy those condos for $800,000? Like, why did yeah. we not buy 10 of them? Like, they're they're $4 million right now. Five million. It's like, such a good point because we all say, <laughs> I wish I could go back 20 years. I'd have bought them all. Yeah. But 20 years from now, they're probably going to have gone up even more yeah. with the way oh, that, yeah. you know, the, the U.S. is spending money. So please, if you're listening to this, just remember that always seems expensive at the time you're buying it. And then <laughs> later on, it always seems like they were giving it away. Yeah. yeah. I always <laughs> say to people when I'm doing my events, I'm like, 
Listen, I mean, if you're interested in investing in real estate, the absolute best time to invest in real estate, you missed it. It was any time yeah. before today, Yeah, right? <laughs> but the second point. best time is now. <laughs> and the worst thing you can do is delay your opportunity to make money in real estate. Like yeah. this, it's not rocket science. Well, you also brought up a really good point. It was I'm buying these condos, not because you just assumed they were going to appreciate. I mean, they likely will, but because you said you can rent them out they will pay for themselves. And that's really the key to the whole thing is buying something that can pay for itself or earn some money while you wait for it to appreciate. And I know you have a very cool story of a time when you were actually the tenant and you went to drop off your rent check and you realized what was going on on the other side of the curtain. Do you mind sharing what that light bulb moment was for you and how it affected you? Uh, the fact that you know that story tells me you've been to one of my events because I don't often <laughs> tell that story, but... I, um, yeah, no, that, that was my light bulb moment. Um, you know, I was 19, 20 years old. I was away at school and my friends and I were, you know, living further and further away from campus with more and more people to be able to afford something. And I had the worst landlord that that year was just the worst landlord. He was brutal. He literally showed up and was like, whoever, there was all these groups that wanted to rent it. We were all standing up front. And he goes, the first group that has uh, cash for first and last month's rent gets the house. And we were like desperate. So we gave him the cash. And then he wrote down on a piece of paper, uh, you know, the bank and an account number and his name. And he basically said, make sure that on the first of every month, you put the money in this account or I'm going to evict you guys. And we were like, you don't want checks? He goes, no. He goes, you take it to my bank and put it in my bank account. <laughs> literally what this guy did. And we never saw him again, right? Like wow. this guy was super lazy. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I was pretty diligent about this. The first of every month, I collected the checks from my friends. I'm like, I'm going to run down to the bank, put it in our landlord's account. And, uh, and I went down to the bank and I deposit. I'm like, I'm here to make a deposit. Gave the girl. I'm like, this is the account. Da, 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 da. And she's like, would you like a receipt? I'm like, yeah, I would love a receipt. And um, she's like, would you like me to print a, a statement of the account? I'm like, yes, please. But I, you know, I guess she was a little naive and she thought it was my <laughs> bank account. And she printed me off a statement that kind of had like the last 30 transactions or so. And I remember looking at it and I was like, okay, I just put $2,000 in this account. That's what I need proof of my deposit. And then I noticed on there a, a MTG mortgage payment, and it was it was like fourteen hundred dollars. And I remember thinking, this was the moment I was like, wait a second. I thought for sure like we were only contributing to part of the expense of this house, not covering the entire <laughs> thing, and then making this guy money because this guy literally spent five minutes that entire year showing up to collect the cash from us and never worked again. And I was like, this is it. If this, you know, slumlord can sit at home sleeping on his couch and make money, this is a job for me. <laughs> and that was that was it. I'm like, we're not renting anymore. We're going to find a house and we're going to figure out if if our rent is actually more than enough to cover everything. And that's when I started looking for properties and then I found one and all my roommates backed out. They're like, no, 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 it's too crazy can't do it. And I'm like, well, will you guys pay me if I do it? They're like, absolutely. So I bought it, bought it. I'm like, that's it. And I mean, it's, it sounds easier than it was because, you know, I remember I talked to my mom and she's like, you can't do this. You, you know, you haven't, you haven't graduated school. You don't have a real job. You don't even have a girlfriend. How are you going to have a house? Like, you know, and, and, so I could, and I had no money. I talked to my brother. He's like, my wife will never let me help you. So I used my student loan that year. I was like, okay, if I close right after I get my student loan and it's my primary residence, you could put 5% down as a primary residence at the time. And I basically just haggled with the seller a little bit and was able to buy, just barely buy this place. I used first and last month's rent from my roommates to cover all my closing costs, like skin of my teeth, bro. I was just able to do this. But the math was was basically saying at the end of this year, you're gonna be you're gonna have more money in your pocket than if you keep paying rent. So I did it. That's so good. Hey, why do you think your friends? Like this is a bigger question, but I'll pose it with your friends as the as the example. 
why do they back out? Why do so many people get excited about real estate? The idea of it, they might logically, it might make sense to them. Like, oh yeah, this would make perfect sense. But instead they chose to pay you money and get no equity and get no upside whatsoever. Why does that happen? Not just to your friends, but to everybody, but it's a good example. Well, I think for most people, they're scared, right? I, and I look back and I've a lot of people have asked me this question, like, why did you do this? Why didn't anyone else do it? And I think for me, you know, th that was a moment in my life where I just, I was pretty desperate. Like I didn't have options. So a lot of my friends, their parents were paying their tuition. Some of them had a car and mom and dad made the payments or covered the insurance. But I, I was basically, I had no other option. To me, this was the only choice. I'm like, what, what else am I going to do? I'm not, you know, my parents aren't helping me. They just can't afford it. Not that they didn't want to, they just couldn't afford it. Like I fend for myself anyway, so I don't have anyone else to answer to. But I was, I realized at that moment when I was about to buy that property that I was just as scared to buy the property as I was to face the rest of my life. Yeah. Without, without a solution. I'm like, I need, I need to try something. And I might, I don't think my friends were just at that moment yet. Like they just didn't have enough pressure in order to pull the trigger. And and I believe that people hesitate about doing something entrepreneurial or starting their own business or investing in real estate because they're just, just a little bit too comfortable, maybe. They're just a little too comfortable. And then it's not until the pressure hits, which I find for most people is realistically when they, when they start actually realizing that retirement is on the horizon. They're like 51 years old and they're like, hold on a second. I'm supposed to be rich. I've done everything right. I do. I've been for, you know, 40 hours a week for most of the year. And I'm just not reaching my financial goals. And they start to have that slight crisis in them where they're like, okay, I've, I've spent, you know, 20 or 30 years proving that this doesn't work. And now it's time to, to try something a little more, what they think is extreme, but realistically, it's, it's more calculated. So for, for my friends, I just, they were too comfortable. They had an option that they had, a, they had an out, but the irony is now they're starting to hit that point where they're like, man, yeah. biggest regret in my life is that I wasn't your business partner 21 <laughs> years ago. And now you're a mega millionaire yeah. and I'm stuck in a job where I, you know, if I were to lose my job, I'd be out of money in three months, yeah. which is insane to me. I, I find it super interesting, this idea that there's like, these two sides of our brain. There's a logical side, which people get the logic of real estate, which is like the math might make sense, but then it's the, the bigger piece of it uh, is like the emotion side of it. And there's a book by Chip and Dan Heath called Switch, which talks about the rider and the elephant. The rider is the logical part. The elephant's like the thing that actually controls our actions in life. And our logic can try to dictate where the elephant goes, but the elephant, the emotional part of us, the fear and, the, and all that, like that's really what drives so much of our life. So if you want to get anywhere amazing in life, you have to get both aligned up together. And, uh, and this is why I think shows like income property and like all your stuff you've done since then, like are so important. I would say media changes mindset. If you want your spouse on board, you want to get there. Like you can try to talk to them all day long, logically why this makes sense. But until you get their elephant on board, it's, it's not going to happen. So like the more you can get the media to change your mindset, like the, the shows you watch, the, the podcasts you consume, the books that you read. That's what changes the elephant and makes it go, oh, yeah, of course I'm going to do this. It just makes perfect sense. So I'm curious what came next for you. Like, I mean, now you now you got the you got the elephant and the rider. You're like, real estate makes sense. You've taken action. You're excited about it. How did you then build your portfolio? What did that first phase of uh, your life, your investing life look like? It was, you know, it was pretty low key, all things considered. I mean, I got that first property and the first thing I, re I recognized was pride of ownership. That's something that was new to me. Like as a renter, when you're, you know, when you're off to, to college or university, when you leave home for the first time and you rent a place, and I fundamentally believe that you should do that. Like when you go to school, like live in residence, like party with your friends, get that out of your system before you make a commitment. Uh, but once I did buy the property, all of a sudden, you know, I think one of the things I tell people is, I remember the first thing happened after I bought the property and I went to the mall, which is where I got my mortgage, by the way, nice. <laughs> at the go. mall. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I went to the mall and I went to go see my mortgage mortgage broker and just make sure everything was cool. And as I was walking through the mall, I was like, holy smokes, 
there are three furniture stores here. When did those get here? Like I had never noticed a furniture store yep. in my life. And then I saw three of them in the mall that day. And I walked in, I'm like, yeah, maybe, maybe we need to buy like a real couch, not one from the Salvation Army. You know, like I started, started getting a little bit like excited about my property. And um, I started, to, then I started to fix up the basement. I'm like, this could be its own apartment down here. Maybe I could use a little more privacy and be nice if I had my own bathroom. I mean, it is my house. It took me, you know, a year or so to, to slowly renovate it, you know, being able to afford literally a dozen two by fours at a time yep. um, and doing most of the work myself. And I'd say over that first year, I, it was really about confirming that I had made a good decision. I was still really nervous and you know every month I'm like okay this worked again like all the checks went in the, the account and the mortgage got paid it's when it's when my mortgage came up for renewal now at the time uh this was mm, the year 2000 basically like a year after I bought it was the year 2000 and you could do short a lot of short term mortgages this was a one year mortgage and it was oh, up weird. for renewal and I went in to talk to my broker about renewing it. And I remember how excited I was. I said, this was such a great decision. It worked out. The math was great. I'm so happy. Um, I said, I just wish I had more properties because not only do my four buddies want to re-rent this place, everyone now knows that I own it. And everybody's asking me, if anybody leaves, can I have a room? And I have a list of like 20 people that would rent rooms for me if I had them. I said, I wish I had four or five more properties. And that's when the broker basically said, well, instead of just renewing, why don't we refinance? I was like, what the hell's, what's this refinance you speak of? <laughs> well, your house value has gone up. I'm like, I was just like going crazy. And I'm a bachelor of commerce. I'm taking a business degree. And I, I remember going to my economics professor and saying, hey, listen, I have this house and I'm now thinking about refinancing it and what that does and my amortization and my term. And like, when are we going to learn about mortgages? I'm third year <laughs> university here. And he said, you learn about your, you learn about mortgages when you buy your first house. And I'm like, I already bought my first house. <laughs> Fuck. I'm, I'm in business. Like this is hundreds of thousands of dollars. You're still giving me a lemonade stand example. Yep. I want to talk about real estate. And I, and my, all of a sudden I realized that my attention was no longer on, you know, the, the micro of everything. It was on the macro. I, I wanted to understand the practical things that were going on in my life, negotiating with sellers, right? How to shop around insurance. I'm like, nobody's teaching me how to do all the things that all my money's being spent on. And this is, this is not what I signed up for. So I refinanced that house. And now I was able, I got some of the equity out, which was insane. I basically quadrupled my down payment. You know, I'd put 70, <laughs> I'd put $7,500 down on that first house, right? That was nothing. Like back then that was everything, but that was like a bargain, obviously. Um, and now all of a sudden I had 30 grand. I was like 30 grand. I'm, I'm rich. I'm basically, I'm like, yeah, rich. <laughs> yeah, yeah. you're set grand. for life. I mean, like retire. rich, yeah. like I'm retiring, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I still had to service that debt. I, yeah. I mean, I wasn't completely oblivious to the fact this was borrowed money against the property that I still owned. So I used that to buy two more properties. And that's when I realized that I had found this system and no one had really taught it to me. It was just, you know, really being desperate and meticulous about every dollar and being petrified of understanding, you know, if I was going to lose money or make money. And I just kept cracking all these nuts. I'm like, wow, I've got cash flow coming in. Like I'm covering all my expenses. And then at the end of the day, I'm making a few hundred dollars. And my renters are paying down the principal balance on my mortgage. That's something I didn't even really think about. But it was like, wow, my mortgage went down. And now I've got equity that I can pull out of this. I was, I'm like, holy smokes, there's even more nuggets in here than I could have imagined. And that's when I started doing you know, what I consider flip to yourself, a lot of people call it the Burr method, right? Burr, yeah. You know, I had bought it, I had renovated the basement a little bit, it gone up in value, I refinanced, I repeated the process. Um, but then I, I really kind of hit the gas after three properties. Um, you know, you hit a lot of roadblocks. But I think my sort of what I call my tent, I was talking to Grant Cardone, two weeks ago, I did a podcast with him. 
And I said, I, I remember my first 10X moment. It's when I went from three properties to 11 properties uh, in a day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it took me a couple of years to get to three properties. Yep. And then in one day I bought eight more houses wow. because I went to my mortgage broker and he said, dude, the rules are changing and getting finances, getting financed is hard all of a sudden. Now they they want bigger down payments. And I'm like, oh my God, I've got this house I want to close on. You got to help me. And he's like, okay. He's like, I'm shopping it around. He's like, he's like, I don't think I'm going to be able to get you more than one more loan with, with all these lenders. They're all saying like this, just one more, just one more. And I'm like, he showed me all the lenders. I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like, you tried all of them. He's like, these ones won't even give you a loan. And these eight lenders would only give you one loan. I'm like, so I can get eight loans one time. <laughs> And he's like, well, theoretically, he's like, you have to basically close on all the properties on the same day so that they don't show up <laughs> on your credit report. I'm like, you've given me my instructions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went out and I bought, I basically lined up and went out and put offers on until I had eight accepted offers all with the same closing date. And I bought eight properties because the rules were changing. And I'm like, this has, this has to be my life. I have to be a real estate investor. And I need to load up right now. And that was that was it. And a, after I was able to close on those properties, the irony is within six months, all the lenders were very, very favorably looking at lending me more money because now I had this, this uh, I used to have this Excel spreadsheet that would have all my cash flow, all my equity, all my mortgage numbers, everything that was going on. And all of a sudden, you know, in positive cash flow alone at the end of that year, I was banking you know, close to $200,000. And when you're making $200,000 in, in income and you have equity building into your properties, all of a sudden the lenders are like, oh, no, 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 we want to give you more loans. I'm like, <laughs> where were you when I needed them? <laughs> yep. <laughs> so here's what's interesting that I love about this story, that this picture that it paints, is that it took you a number of years and, and a lot of work and effort to get those first few deals, the one, two, and three, right? I like to, to relate it to a, get a train up and going, right? Like a train moves very slowly in the beginning. And a lot of people give up during that phase. Uh, but in reality, what you're doing during that time, you might not be, you're not, nobody's getting rich off their first two properties or three properties, most likely, right? They might, yeah, it's, it's the knowledge and experience in, in networking and connections and confidence and all that, that builds, that gets you to the eight that you buy. And then the eight gets you to the next phase, which gets you to the apartment or the 50 houses or the, you know, whatever it is you buy next. Uh, and each kind of builds upon itself. Did you see that in your own life as well? Definitely. And, and when I'm teaching people the same way, when you guys are teaching people, you know, it's, it's exciting to get people fired up about the opportunity, but you have to balance that with the reality of how much suck there is in those first <laughs> few years. Yeah. Like, you know, I remember 21, 22, long weekends in the summer, everybody's going to the lake and partying. And I'm like, I can't, I have tenants moving in on Monday and I'm not finished drywalling. Like I remember spending seven days a week you know, 10, 12 hour days, like racing around like a madman to try to get it set up. So when you're in the when you're in the weeds at the beginning, there's a lot of suck. There's like, yeah. why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? So you have to be patient and you have to, you know, continue to look at what's the five year outcome of my efforts, because, you know, those like I said, those first few years, it's exciting. Everybody loves buying properties, but then it sucks when you're rent, trying to fix them all up and you're going over budget and you got you know, bogus tenants over here. There's a million things that happen as you're learning. And, you know, it's hard to promote that to people. I'm always like, you're going to hate me for the first 18 months. <laughs> and yep. then in five years from now, you're going to come back and hug me and love me and thank me. So just be prepared for that part. You know, that that was really, really hard. Like you said, getting that train moving took more energy than I knew I had. And, um, and, and uh, I, I don't forget it. I always try to I always try to kind of sit down and say, okay, when I'm training people, all these people are excited because they see the results. They see the wealth, they see the TV shows, they see like the lifestyle and they're like, that's what I want. And it's not instant gratification, right? This is real estate is get rich slow. That's, that's the thing. There's no such thing as get rich quick. It's hard work, quick, get rich, slow. 
The difference being there's not a lot of things that are going to get you rich these days, and a job certainly isn't one of them. So you might as well put your hard work into something that's going to get you to those results. And and it, you know, I think by the time I got those eight properties, I was in way over my head at that point. It took me a year and a half to optimize them. I called it the optimization phase. And that's when you're renovating it, um, making it worth its most money, and getting it rented out for a premium. That's the optimization phase, which is really critical. A lot of people skip this. They buy one and they close on it and they're already looking for the next one. I'm like, you have not finished optimizing, right? You've got to get it max performance. So I got those eight to max performance. I'm like, okay, hey, I can now refinance them and get equity out. I've got tenants that love the place and are paying a premium. Um, and then I needed a plan. I actually didn't come up with a plan until I had the, all those properties. I'm like, where am I going with this? Like, this has just been an experiment. Um, so my first goal was to have 25 properties by the age of 25, which I did. And that was huge for me because again, this was another moment where I'm like, am I crazy? 25 properties. Like, I don't even know anyone <laughs> with 25 properties. At one point, my parents had a cottage for a few years and I was like, two properties, that's gangster, right? So for me to think of 25 properties, I'm like, that's like, that's a goal that's hard enough that it's going to make me bust my butt, but it's, you know, I've got 11. So it's just like doubling it in a bit. And I've got three years, you know, two and a half years to do it. Um, and I figured it out. I just, I figured it out and I started buying multiplexes. All of a sudden multi-units became uh, the flavor for me. It was no more single family. It was all had to be two, three or four units for me, just because the cash flow was was high enough that it could support my goal of getting enough financing to get the next one and the next one and the next one. Um, after 25, uh, I, interestingly enough, I bought 33 properties in uh, in a week after Whoa. hitting that goal. I just was so I was so like, pumped about it. I went to an auction in Ohio and I was there and I had met this property manager who was like preaching about these properties. So I went to go see them. We went to an auction and there was nobody there. It was like a ghost town. And uh, they were trying to sell all these properties. And I ended up negotiating with the, with the auction house and the, and the bank that had all these REOs. And I bought all 33 in one wow. shot. Wow. I was like, this is it. This is how you're going to do it, right? You know, 25, 26 years old at that point. And, in, and after that, I was really willing to try just about anything. I started doing a lot of wholesaling and flipping because a lot of people, gurus told me I should do it. That was a bit of a mistake, to be honest. I should have just stuck with the buy and hold. A lot of the properties that I flipped in like 2008, 2009, um, They've doubled in value yeah. <laughs> at this point, so I should have just kept them. Um, but yeah, it's uh, that was you know those the first ten years of investing was was a roller coaster, right? To go from zero to to one was the hardest. From one to three was maybe half as hard, uh, and then buying eight was not even as hard as buying the first one and then buying 33 was easier than the first 25 you know like it was it gets just exponentially simpler as you go along you have more financing opportunities you've got more confidence you're running the numbers like this you become what i call a professional buyer there's a lot of a lot of people in real estate have no idea how to buy real estate they think you just go you make an offer and that's it meanwhile i'm like have you tried putting in a double offer, right? Have you tried putting in backup offers? You know, when a house sells, when, when I'm going to see a house and they're like, oh, well, I'm sorry, we've accepted an offer. I'm like, great. I hope it falls apart because I'm going to give you a backup <laughs> offer, right? I'm like, not to be rude, but would you, if that deal fell apart, would you be interested in this? And they're like, well, maybe if it fell apart, I'm like, well, then let's sign it as a backup offer. It automatically is accepted if your other offer falls apart. I've, I've gotten tons of properties like that. So just becoming a bit of a, a ninja in the space and trying to figure out all these moves. And, and then people are like, how'd you get that house? I thought it was sold. I'm like, it was sold. They're like, how did you know a deal fell apart? I'm like, I put an offer in before the deal fell apart, just in case it would. 
right? Just stuff that people didn't even know you're allowed to do. Half of the agents I work with are like, are you allowed to do this? I'm like, watch <laughs> me, <laughs> watch me, right? Let's put in a double offer. That's one of my favorite is when you yeah, put what do you in mean a double, double offer? offer on a property. So you have you done a double offer? I, I don't know. What, I don't know what the, I don't know. Tell me what it is and I'll tell you if I've Probably. done it. I don't know the it's term. A, one of my favorite things. I did this a few years ago. There was a property that was, you know, listed for over a hundred days. It was getting pretty old. And, uh, and the, I spoke to the listing agent and the listing agent was like, no, you know, it's, you know, it's been, they're very specific and they're, we're, they only want this type of offer, blah, 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 blah. So I went home and I have all the documents and I started to fill out an offer. And I was like, gosh, they want no conditions and all these, you know, they want to be able to take certain fixtures and they were very picky. So I'm like, fine. I'm like, here's everything that the agent told me they want. And then I reduced the price by like 20%. I was like, you know, here's, here's everything you want. And here's the price I want basically. And then I wrote the offer that I wanted and I gave them asking price. So and I took both offers to the agent and I said, I have two offers. And they're like, well, who's the other one from? I'm like, they're both from me. And they're like, I don't understand. I said, well, you should tell your, you should tell your client that they're in uh, a bidding war now, which is the most exciting thing ever for them. Congratulations, right? It's a bidding <laughs> war. I've got two offers coming in at the same time. One is everything you want. It's just 20% less than your asking price. And the other one has a few little terms and conditions that I tend to like and that I need. Uh, to make it work for me. And it's your asking price. Yep. Guess Dude. what? Yeah. They took my offer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love it's it. It's crazy. And these are people who couldn't make a decision. She's like, offers have come in. They haven't made a decision. I'm like, maybe they just need some pressure. Maybe yeah. they just need a decision where it's not yes or no, but yep. yes, yes or no, right? Yeah. Increase my odds a little bit. I've been, I, I teach this stuff on webinars occasionally. I do this webinar where I teach about like my seven sneaky tricks for getting your offer accepted. And it's exactly one of them. I like that term though. I never had a phrase for it. We're going to call it, we're calling it the double offer from now on. Cause yeah, when, it Scott's, Scott's, Scott's double offer. The Scott's double offer TM. We'll put a little TM on it. It'll be great. <laughs> the Scotty Mac method. That's what we're going to call it. Scotty Mac method. Yeah, no, dude, yeah. it's so good. Cause when you offer people two options, I would say this, I say, Starbucks, you go to Starbucks and they got the tall, the grande and the venti, right? They do that. Largely so you don't remember 7-Eleven has the same cup of coffee for 79 cents. When you give people multiple options, they choose between the available options, not between external options. And so that's exactly what you're doing. I, we, we, this is going to sound excessive and I don't recommend this, but we literally put together an offer uh, for a mobile home park recently and we gave them 31 offers. 31 offers. Now, now it sounds ridiculous. It wasn't to the seller, to the broker, but we basically laid out 31 different things to this broker of like, yes. this is what we want to do. And they helped us take those 31 down to, I think it was, we ended up with seven that we actually gave to the seller. Uh, and it was a huge complex deal, but like, that's like, we do that because we're like, we, we want to find the way. And again, that's excessive. And there was a very specific reason why that deal worked that way. But I love that. I love the the Scotty Mac method. It's great. The Scotty, the Scotty <laughs> Mick method. I like it. The, but, the, uh, Mick, the Mick you method. Know, it's not, it's not it's like great. these things are, these things are pulled out of, you know, nowhere either. Like obviously with the amount of real estate investing you've done and I've done, it's, it's strategic. There's a, yeah. there's rationale behind all this. I don't know if I told you this last time, but you would love, um, a book about behavioral economics. Have you read a book, any books about behavioral economics? I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, this is critical. I mean, anyone who's an entrepreneur, and especially if you're in real estate, I tell people you need to read a book about behavioral economics, which, help, which really helps you understand why people are motivated and what drives people to make decisions. There's a great book by Robert Cialdini that you should read. He's, he's, the gen he's the genius when it comes to behavioral economics. Uh, I think it's called Principles of Persuasion, but it, uh, it changed the way... I have a book by him right here. It's a uh, persuasion. Is that the one or persuasion. is that different? Persuasion. Persuasion is. That is okay, go ahead. I think. Oh no, no. Here's what you want. He's got a couple of them, right? I have not read this. It's just sitting on my shelf. This is the one you want. Oh yeah, influence. Yes. Influence. It's the one before that one. Yes. Yes. This is I like the sequel. We just pulled them both out of our stack. <laughs> I have that one as well. I haven't read it yet. Yeah. Same. That's funny. Yeah. The one you're holding right there, influence. That that was. Yeah. I did read that, and it was phenomenal. In fact, I phenomenal. use a lot of those things in my life. Like oh, all so about behavioral economics. Yeah. yeah so sorry. Good. Influence. Influence. Yep. It's so, so good. good. And um, 
after reading that book, I actually changed the way I do my presentations and the way I explain things to people. I was able to strategize a lot of the things that I had found through trial and error, right? Um, even things like, you know, in 2000 and let's say somewhere around 2005, uh, a lot of my rental properties were student rental properties, right? And one of the big challenges of student rental properties is when you turn them over, it's a, it's a mess. Like there's just there's garbage and leftover furniture and nobody returns their keys. Um, but I started giving gifts to my tenants when they moved in. And I started oh, yeah. doing that uh, because I had asked some tenants, you know, to allow me to come in and show the property. I it really asked a lot of them. And then I was like, oh, you know, I, I feel bad. I got to get them something. I got them a gift. Um, and then they, they didn't take the gift. It was a bottle of wine. They had already moved out. So I was like, I'll give it to my next tenant. So I left it there. I'm like, and I just wrote a note, welcome to your new home. Um, and it was amazing how much less work those tenants were when I started off the relationship using reciprocity, which is one of Cialdini's, um, you know, persuasion text techniques yep. and this. There's nothing, you know, sneaky about it. It's it's really just being a good person and having some form of demonstration for it. So now when any tenant moves into one of my properties, I give them a gift when they move in. I'm telling you that it for the 30 or 40 bucks you spend on a gift, it saves you thousands of dollars in property managers coming to fix things. They If they have a broken light bulb, they just change it. They're like, you know what? My landlord's awesome. I'm just going to change the light bulb. And when they have a problem, they don't want to bother you because they're like, my landlord's a nice person. They gave me a gift when I moved in. And when they leave, honest to goodness, half of them leave a gift when they leave. It's crazy. <laughs> I, I'm just That's like funny. blown away by this simple little thing. And, you know, this is one tiny tip. Throw this in your sneaky, you know, yeah, your little you sneaky pile sneaky over tricks. there. You're going to have now 12 it's sneaky <laughs> ideas by the time we're done. But, you know, you add all these things together, like you said, and it starts to make a huge difference to your bottom line. We had a seller recently, real quick, I'll throw this story. Uh, we had a seller, uh, we didn't get the deal, I will say that, so it didn't work this time, but I still love this story, is in talking with them, they're a motivated seller, they kept talking about how much they love shrimp burgers at this one restaurant that was like four hours from their house, they never go there. Uh, and so we went and we found somebody to go there and get a physical gift certificate for it was like $250 gift certificate for shrimp burgers at this <laughs> restaurant. And we gave it to him with our offer. Again, it didn't work that time. But like, we're at, at, yeah, at our, at our real estate company, like we do that kind of stuff all the time, just little things that just make people go like, I really like them. Like, what a nice, what a nice people. What it's nice people. amazing how many people are are persuaded through, you know, emotion and yeah. things like that, you know, so genius. Okay. I love all of it. You did awesome. I mean, you've used lots of strategies to scale this portfolio over time. You learn very quickly. Can I ask, what are you doing now? What type of projects are you taking on and how are you growing your portfolio? Sure. Um, well, you know, the last eight months have been very interesting, not necessarily in a terrible way for real estate, for the world, yes. Um, and I was recently telling somebody, this is the third time I've seen a fairly major disruption in, in the world, you know, the first time with a tech bubble that burst in 1999, 2000, I was just buying my first property, but even that worried me. And I don't know why it was just in the news all the time. They're like, oh, the tech bubble burst. I'm like, is this gonna affect real estate? Which it did not. My real estate did and performed perfectly fine. And then in 2008, you know, here I am with uh, almost a hundred properties probably at that point. And all of a sudden the worst real estate crash in uh, modern history. And I really worried about that too. I was like, oh my goodness, what am I to do? The, uh, the real estate market is going to be disaster. But you know, if you, when I focused on the fundamentals, which are, are my tenants actually going anywhere? No. Am I still getting positive cash flow? Yes. Um, I started to realize that the people who were losing money were the speculators, right? The real estate speculators are the one who buy something that they think is going to go up in value, and then they have no plan for in between. It could be pre-construction, it could be vacant land, it could be anything, right? Land bankers, all these, all these people like, I'll buy 10 pre-construction houses, and as soon as they're built, I'll sell them and make money. That's called gambling, right? That's not an actual, that's not an actual strategy that you can control. <laughs> so 
for me, I wasn't doing a lot of that. I was mostly doing buy and hold rentals. And so when the market crashed, I held, I sold nothing. In 2008, 2009, I sold zero properties, therefore lost zero dollars. My renters didn't go anywhere. In fact, what ended up happening, and only people that were, were real estate investors through that period will be able to tell you the real magic was when interest rates came down. Yeah, Because interest rates dropped, which is the largest expense you have as a buy and hold investor. Yep. Therefore, your cash flow goes up. So all of a sudden, I was more profitable. Interest rates, I had mortgages that were prime minus 2.1. They were what were considered ARM, you know, yeah, adjustable, adjustable rate mortgages. In Canada, they call them variable rate mortgages. And I had a lot of both. That was, that was my jam. I'm like, everything is variable, right? And so prime minus 2.1 was a good rate. Effectively, I was at like 5% when the interest rate was at 7 but then prime went all the way to two <laughs> and I was locked in at prime minus 2.1. This is what nobody talks about is that I was in negative interest rate territory. Wow. This people say it's not possible. It happened. Now I'll tell you what happens is you stop at zero. There's in the fine yeah, print, don't they don't money. actually pay you to have a mortgage <laughs> yet. And I ended up at zero interest for, you know, two to three years as those mortgages came to expire. I'm like, why? Why isn't anyone talking about this? I have a clip of me on CNN in 2008 having a debate when the other uh, when the host is saying it's the worst time to be in real estate. And I'm saying this is the biggest opportunity in real estate in our lives. And I'm having this debate and I'm talking about interest rates. And they're like, what does interest rates have to do with anything? I'm like, it has to do with everything <laughs> in cash flow. You know, and they're like, but people are losing their houses. I said, yeah. That has nothing to do with making money in real estate. That has to do with, you know, you know, people's homes. And there's a lot of terrible things happening. But if you're a real estate investor, don't tell me this is a bad time. This is the most opportunistic moment in our lives. And I use that clip at my events because that was the last time that there was a huge disruption. And now we are here. We're here. There's been a pandemic, um, tr tremendous amount of disruption. And this time it's global. Like there is no country that has escaped this disruption, which is unreal, unprecedented, right? And so six months ago, I start, I changed my live events to virtual events, started running virtual events. Our first one, we had about 7,000 people register. And the first thing I said was pay attention because there's going to be, again, a massive surge in real estate post pandemic as all of this stimulus and all of this money printing hits the markets, it's going to be crazy. And, and you're going to look back on your life and say, what did I do about it during that pandemic, right? It goes to that saying, never let a tragedy go to waste. The whole world is in a tragedy. Do not waste this opportunity to recognize that this disruption is going to create a massive transfer of wealth. And I know what side of that I want to be on every time. Um, and, and we've all been given, you know, the whole world has been given an excuse to take a break and to think about their lives and to think about where they're going and what they want to do and who they're with and where they were. We were all been forced to take a breath. And if you haven't recognized in this moment that there are things that you want to pursue or that you want to do that you're not trying now, you're never going to do it. You're never going to do it if you're not doing it now. So that's, that's what this... This has taught me what's happening right now. I'm doubling down. That's what I'm doing. I'm I'm buying more properties in the last six months than almost in the last six years. All right, and and you're on you're doing kind of a unique niche now. You know, when I was on your show recently, we talked about that a little bit. I want to I want to dive into that a little bit here. So, what are you buying and why? Because it's it's something we have not actually ever talked about here on the uh, Bigger Pockets podcast. Yeah, well, let me be the first to be a trendsetter then yes, for you because I, I love blazing new trails. And I'm always, you know, my strategy is buy what everyone else isn't looking at right now. Mm -hmm. Right. That's, and, and I, again, I kind of pepper that in with, you know, buy what everyone else isn't looking at right now, but you know, has the potential on the horizon to be super important. Right. I'm not, you know, buying swampland or anything like that, but. Something that I've noticed that people have shied away from over the last, you know, for, for 20 or 30 years now, people have been shying away from the smaller kind of mom and pop resorts. 
these are the the dirty dancing style resorts of you know the of days days past when people used to travel domestically and spend time with their family up at the lake or up at the cottage um so when when everything started happening a few months ago with the with covid you know we realized that global travel lost its you know lost its its lux right all of a sudden it's like you got to stay somewhat local which put a lot of pressure on local vacations and vacation properties lodges uh cottages but not not the big ones not like the big hotels where you have too many people i'm talking the ones where you have individual cabins and people have space and you know right now to try to buy a waterfront property it's it's very difficult in the last few months it's been a lot of pressure to buy these properties but some of these properties that are in that that sweet spot they're a little too big for the average individual to buy like you can't just go out and buy a 20 cabin camp and say this is our new vacation home but it's not on the radar of the huge conglomerates who are looking to build you know 6000 hotel rooms and casinos it lands in that sweet spot it's off the radar and if you break it down price per square foot or price per cabin or price per bedroom the way we do as investors the the discounts are phenomenal so i've bought two camps i call them camps one is a fishing resort it's got 12 cabins half of the six of them are right on the water and then there's a main sort of lodge on the water and then the other ones are all set back behind um, but you're talking, you know, several hundred feet of waterfront. If you were to buy uh, the cottage next door, let's say, let's say it was just on its own lot, you'd be paying hundreds of thousands of dollars just for that one versus for a million bucks, I can get 12 of them, right? Or <laughs> 1.5 million. It's, it's not a ton of money. When you think about it, I get 12 cottages for, I could, or I could just go buy two or three cottages over here. And I am in with one of them right now. I'm actually uh, severing it off into five waterfront properties and then a, and then an easement for the other cottages at the back to have their own shared waterfront. And you're talking about turning, you know, a two, two to three million dollar investment into a five plus million dollar return just on all the zoning changes and a little bit of upgrades here and there. Uh, you know, you can make between one and two million dollars in a couple months as a side hustle. I'm not working on it full time. I have my team working on it. Yeah. And so I started to identify this and I started to look at more of them. And we just uh, we just locked one up in the Catskills, which is an awesome, awesome resort on a beautiful body of water. And same thing. It's like mom and pop. They've owned this thing for 30 years. They're tired of running it this year with COVID. They just shut the whole thing down. And they're just like, we're done. And I'm like, okie dokie, then let's see what we can do with this. You know, because I don't want to be buying singlings or individual properties. I forbid myself to do it. Several years ago, I'm like, that's it. I'm I'm good at it. I like it, but it's it's holding me back. You know, you know, when you see that property, you're like, gosh, I used to do those all day long. And you're like, don't do it, man. Don't get cut, don't spend your time over there. You got to push yourself. So I'm like, okay, push myself. So you know, sort of 12 units is my minimum. I'm like, I don't want to touch anything that's less than 12 units because I'm not growing if I'm doing that. If I'm buying a, a duplex, it's like I should be teaching someone else how to buy that property at this point, not trying to buy it myself. It doesn't make sense. So I've been working on a couple of camps. Yeah, that's cats out of the bag. And now I'm going to be competing with people who are listening to bigger pockets <laughs> on the next one. Yeah, don't do it. Everybody just stay away. They're, don't they're terrible. It. It's terrible. They're oh, terrible. it's awful. You have to spend your time by the lake yeah. and then you have to go <laughs> swimming. And awful. then you're just basically on vacation while you're working. It's awful. I say this with mobile home parks a lot. I got in the mobile home parks, started talking about them. Now I created my own competition. But people often think because Brandon from bigger pockets went and did mobile home parks, they're the best investment. The truth is like, they're just one of hundreds of cool investments right now that could work. And I just picked one and you picked one as well. And David Green here is picking one. Like we're just, we're picking these like niche things because the things that maybe we got started with aren't as easy or maybe there's just a lot of competition there. So I, I it's cliche, but the riches are in the niches right now. And I think that's the a- Riches are in yeah. the niches. I like that. And, yeah. you, and you know what? The other thing is to be clear, and I know you know this, but it's 
the fundamentals don't change. I'm yep. still running a cash flow analysis. I'm yep. still running a cash flow analysis, even though the types of properties are changing. And to be honest, I think next year I'm going to be looking at commercial space. I feel mm -hmm. like commercial space is going to be uh, this new opportunity, right? Where there's just too much vacancy. Once the pressure hits that market, um, I'm going to look at doing conversions of commercial into residential. Some of the most, you know, some of the best pieces of real estate are right now dedicated to commercial, which if you converted to residential, could be a huge opportunity, especially in the cities. Totally agreed. I love it. So let me ask you kind of a, one of our kind of last questions here is where do you, where do you see the, the economy headed? Like where and put on your crystal, you know, put your crystal ball in the desk real quick. Where do you see the next year, year and a half, two years headed uh, for real estate? For real estate? Well, in general, there's going to be volatility because right now there's so much uncertainty, um, which means it's a good time to be involved, right? You've got to get in while there's uncertainty. Once everything is, is let's say, normalized again, it's too late, right? That's coasting. That's where you coast. For real estate right now, to be honest, the, the biggest things that I see influencing real estate, which is no secret, is number one, interest rates. And uh, this weekend, I was able to secure a conventional mortgage for 0.99%. Whoa. Point under 1%. Under 1%. Is that in Canada or is that in the U.S.? That's a Canadian. That is a Canadian product. You guys got stuff going good. Wow. We got... Uh, but <laughs> I let there's like two and a half here, but that's, that's amazing. But here's, you know what, here's the advantage of being someone that I spend, you know, part of my time in Florida and investing in the U S and I spend a little more time obviously in Toronto and I started investing in Canada. And it's really interesting to see the differences and to understand, you know, sometimes things happen in the U S first. And I get like the inside scoop. I'm like, oh, here's what's happening in the US. Let me try it. Let me be the first to try that in Canada. And then Canada will come out with something. I'm like, ooh, this is interesting. I can see like Canada is Canada's a little more like Europe. Let's put it that way. And America is a lot like America. <laughs> so that's the only way to look at it. Yeah. Like, you know, like Canada is halfway between America and Europe. We're like somewhere in between those two. So so some things are happening in Canada right now that with a uh, with a democratic government coming in in the United States, it's going to look a little bit more like Canada for the next four to eight years, to be honest. When you yeah. guys have um, what we would call a conservative government or Republican government, uh, it starts to look a little foreign to us. We don't really like we get it, but we're just kind of like, uh, let's just see what happens. Yeah. So. Um, interestingly enough, you're probably going to see Biden taking more of a, dare I say, a Canadian or European global style of, of approach to the country. So you're going to see things that have been happening in Canada for the last few years starting to show up in the United States, like lower interest rates. So to me, I think the reality is North America is going to see sub 1% interest rates in the next few years. Now this, wow. you may already know this, but like in Denmark, you can get a mortgage for negative 1.5%. Wow. Yeah. And like, <laughs> that's, like that's, crazy. that's blowing your mind. It took, me, mind, yeah. it took me a couple of weeks to figure out how that works exactly. Yeah. But it's true. Even in Germany, you can get a sub zero mortgage. And now we're seeing them, uh, you know, in, in, in Canada, we're seeing sub 1%. I think in the U S you're going to start to see, uh, some serious discounts because, there's so much money that's being printed. People just are putting it everywhere. Like there's just too much money. So there's no interest to be paid. And, um, and that's, that's the reality. That's the reality of, you know, uh, after a huge crisis, the more aid we see, like the more financial aid packages that go out, the lower your interest rates are going to be in the future. So, and the lower interest rates are, the more real estate increases. Yep. And that's something that the governments have a real problem with when you have a, democratic style government, which is trying to promote, um, you know, the average individual having the financial capability to service their debt, what happens as a, um, a sort of a repercussion or a reaction to that is the lower interest rates means real estate goes up. So it's, it's like, how do you do both? It's really crazy. 
Um, so I continue to see real estate prices going up as interest rates go down. That is the number one thing. Now to, to also back that up, what I see happening in the next few years, and this is going to be North America wide. I think this will be in the U S I already know it's going to happen in Canada. Canada just launched its most aggressive immigration plan since the 1800s. Mm. So in, in over 120 years, we've never had a more aggressive immigration plan, meaning we are there, you know, Canada is attracting about a million, looking to attract a million uh, new Canadians next year. I see something similar happening in the United States. The last four or five years has been very, um, you know, if it's been a very domestic policy, it hasn't been an international policy. It hasn't been something that's been super uh, inviting for people to move to the United States. In fact, you know, the interesting thing about being in Canada half the time and then see, looking in is uh, we had Canada had the most international students on record in 2018 and 2019 because almost half of the people who would have normally gone to college or university in the United States chose to go to Canada instead. And we couldn't even, we couldn't even bring them all in. There was almost a million students that showed wow. up to, to our post-secondary education institutions. So rental rates in student housing went up about 30%. It was nuts. Um, now you're going to see the opposite of that. You're going to see a more inviting uh, global, uh, more, more, more inviting to the global market in the U S. And I think what we're going to see is this, the lower interest rates, which is going to drive up housing prices. You're going to see more immigration into the United States, which is going to push up housing prices. And you're going to see international students returning to the U S market without the fear of being, you know, deported or held up at the airport or not being able to go see their family. So you kind of add those three things together and there's a tremendous amount of pressure. And it's not just a straight trajectory going up. You and I both know that. The next few months, if not the next year and a half, it's going to be a bumpy ride to get there. But that's the most interesting time to get in. You want to get in during the bumpy part so that when it does start to coast, you're already in and not trying to chase it. That would be my sort of three to five year horizon. Anything after that, Anyone who tries to tell you what's going to happen after that is a liar <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because you never know what's going to happen. Nobody knows. No one knows what's going to happen in the next election. Nobody yeah, knew no there idea. was a pandemic coming. Nobody knows. Those are the things that are going to have the largest impact. It's the unknowns. It's just if everything stays calm and follows, you know, the current path we're on, this is what could happen. We all know you and I uh, all know that real estate will go up and down all the way up. So, you know, as long as you've got a five to six year trajectory with your investing strategy, you're, you're pretty okay. bulletproof. That's awesome, man. That was so good. Like just like your understanding of the global movements of people and, and money, I think was phenomenal. I'm going to actually, when we do our introduction at the beginning of the show, I'm going to call out that point and tell people they should go listen to this for sure. Cause that was really, really good. Uh, but we got to get you out of here, I know. We got to close up shop here in a minute. So I want to shift over to our last segment of our show. It's called our Famous, famous four. four. Question number one of the Famous Four. Do you have a current favorite real estate or like a, a, like a lifetime favorite real estate specifically related book? Any book for real estate investors that you recommend? Oh, boy. Well, I, you know. The, I mean, mo the one that comes to mind, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, everybody's okay. read that one. Sure. I think that's the one that triggers a lot of people to get started in real estate investing. I would just, I would go with that one. I, that book has inspired more people than anyone else, uh, than any other book that I can think of. And if you're, if you haven't read it yet, start there. All right. I know we discussed a couple, but what is your favorite business book? My favorite business book. You know what book I like is The E-Myth. I don't know if you've yeah. read The E-Myth. I have. I love that book. That was very helpful for, for helpful for me about 10 years ago. Um, it changed the way that I kind of spent my time and what I decided to work on. Um, also, The Strength Finder. Yeah, I'm going to give you two. I like The Strength Finder. Simple, quick read, and it helps explain who you work well with. It's something that for years at our office, we used to make all new employees read it. And then they would put up their strengths and see who who they align the most with in the company. And then they would go out for lunch with that person on their first day on the job. 
That's cool. That's yeah. smart. I love it. All right. What about some of your hobbies? Some of my hobbies. Uh, well, TV shows. I like, <laughs> I like making TV shows. <laughs> weren't you in some magazine for like Sexiest Man? Like, weren't you in something? <laughs> some sexiest you, Man you Alive. You're right. That's what I thought. 2017, yeah. 16, right. maybe. There you go. Yeah, that's not a hobby, yeah. by the way. <laughs> Being good hobby. looking is a is a hobby, uh, a hobby that I'm not very good at, but you know, working at it. Anyway, I would say, you know, <laughs> I mean, I love swimming. I'm always, you know, spending time in anything in the water. I love. I wish I got out surfing more, like yourself. I'm not quite that dedicated, but um, you know, anything to do with the water, I'm a huge fan. And you know, as a dad, I just love spending time with my kids. So that's pretty much being a dad is my favorite hobby. All right. Well, my last question of the day is what do you think separates successful real estate investors from all those who give up or they fail or they just never get started? No, oh, ugly. Ugly people can't do this. That's I agree. hundred percent. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> you know, I think starting is the thing that stops the most is that stops most people, you know, being able to get that first deal done. There's a lot of people that look into this and do the research and they get caught in the you know, education, what I call the education phase of real estate investing, which which is great if you want to have, you know, an MBA in real estate, which doesn't make you any money. It's the people that buy properties. So the thing that stops people that separates successful people from non successful people are the ones who realize you'll never know everything about real estate, you just have to know enough to buy your first property. And then though that's the difference, the people who the, some of the smartest people I know are some of the people who struggle with their finances the most because they outsmart themselves. It's like they they look into it too much and they find a reason why it might not work after looking at 500 reasons why it could work. Right. So it, the difference is once you find an opportunity. Oh, yeah, this is what I like to tell people. Let's narrow it down to this. Once you identify an opportunity that is profitable in real estate, don't ask any more questions, buy it. What are you waiting for? Like I say, if you've been able to calculate that this is going to make me $200 a month, what the hell are you waiting for? Yeah. <laughs> buy it. Don't wait for the one that makes 250, buy that one as well, Yep. right? Buy them all. And this goes back to what we talked about earlier when we talk about like the first deal was so hard and the next one's got a little easier even though they're bigger, right? Nobody looks back in their life. Like right now you have hundreds of units, right? Like you don't look back and go, oh, that first deal only cash flowed a 11% return. I really wanted 12. I wish I wouldn't have bought that. Like nobody says that. Like nobody says it, that. It got you in the game. That's the most Absolutely. important part. Absolutely. Yeah. And what it's doing in year 10 is so vastly different from what it did in year one that yeah. that extra one or 2% that you thought was such a big deal is literally yeah. not even a factor in how that asset operates. That's another thing I've seen. Not even a factor. You got it, David. Very awesome. good advice there, Scott. This is awesome. Okay. So for people who want to hear more of your sage wisdom wisdom with your stunning good looks, where can they find out more about you? Well, definitely you can follow me on social media and on Instagram. You can check out my podcast, which is The Real Estate Rebel with Scott McGilvery. You want to you check go. that out for sure. Um, and just watch the shows, man. I got all new shows coming out on HGTV in the new year. And it's always about real estate investing. That's awesome, man. And I was on uh, season two, episode eight of your podcast. So go check out if you want to listen to me sharing my not as good of wisdom as Scotty Mick did. Dude, you uh, were awesome. Check it out. You were a fan favorite <laughs> from that season. Come on. Oh, good. All right. Well, appreciate you, man. This has been phenomenal. Thank you so much. I uh, love every second of it. Thanks so much, guys. We'll see you soon. This is David Green for Brandon, Bigger Pocket Sexiest Man Alive. Turner, signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.